All right, so um, continuing our discussion on our, our lessons on um, lifespan development, we're, we're looking at the next step, you know, we're going through this progression of, of ages, this progression of uh, milestones and benchmarks and development. And last week we talked about middle childhood. This week we're going to talk about late childhood or as we uh, most commonly know as teenage years or adolescence, okay? Um, and as I mentioned before, we're going to start to see a little bit of these merging of topics instead of breaking each week out into physical and cognitive and social development, we're going to be merging them really into one lesson because not a lot changes. I mean, we do have some changes, but if we were looking at this from a biological perspective, we would certainly break out uh, a little bit more of uh, the psychological, I'm sorry, the phys physiological growth that occurs. But this is a psychology class, so I like to really focus on the cognitive and the social development that, that occurs in these, these stages. And it's a, an important stage. Um, how many of you uh, think, uh, uh, if you had to rate like the top three stages in life that, that are most important, what do you think you would rate them as? Like if we look at prenatal versus early childhood versus middle childhood versus late childhood versus early adulthood, uh, so on and so forth, what, uh, what would be your top three as, as far as importance? in any sphere, in, uh, any domain, physical, cognitive, or social. Anybody care to share? Well, I think that um, like early and middle childhood between the ages of like three and 12 are really important for social development. Um, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot since COVID started um, with the children who are in school who haven't really gotten to experience the social aspect of school and also how um, unpredictable it was. So I've seen just in interacting with children in my own life, some regression in their social development throughout this whole ordeal. Okay, uh, if you don't mind me asking, Leanna, you, so you said a regression, what, uh, uh, what would you describe as a regression? Just not really knowing how to handle a social situation as well as they had previously. Um, okay, sorry, I had to yawn. That's all right. Especially okay. like the younger children. Okay, okay. Um, and, and you're not alone in that because I think uh, on, on the whole, I think a lot of uh, parents probably and caretakers experience the, uh, the, the very same thing. Um, seeing, uh, I, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't necessarily say a regression perhaps, but uh, just not continuing that social development that they were before. Um, and now we're, we're kind of getting back into things and it's a little bit awkward, you know. Um, and you know, it, 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 my, you know, we we're always faced with tragedy. We're always faced with with some kind of crises that uh, uh, that forces us to adapt and overcome and figure out new ways of dealing with things. And I would say, when we're looking at at uh, social development, I would say probably one of the the most um, salient or or important timeframes for this is probably late childhood or early adolescence or adolescence uh, for that very reason, because they're starting to gain a little bit more insight into what other people are thinking and what some of those social norms are and how they are going to be predictable as, as young adults and, and uh, so on and, and much later beyond that. So um, absolutely, I think, uh, I think probably one of the bigger areas that were impacted were the sociability of um, uh, early teens and, and adolescents, okay, for that very reason. So anyway, yeah, I, I would agree with that. So looking at the prenatal, um, and this is just kind of my opinion, we, we are more focused with the physical and the cognitive. As, as we get into middle childhood, we're looking more at the cognitive and the social. Physical is still important, 
um, but it's still, um, it's kind of on its own trajectory at this point. I mean, um, nourishment and nutrition and physicality and um, uh, exercise are all still very important at those ages, but those are kind of the things that we focus on in prenatal and perinatal uh, stages, right? Um, and then of course, as we get into adolescence and early adulthood, social tends to be the thing that we're, we're fixating on, right? Um, cognitive is still an important part of it. Physical kind of, again, on its own trajectory, but cognitive really takes place earlier on and helps them to develop what they are today in social situations. And if you remember, when we were talking about intelligence, we were really discussing a lot of, um, of, of really how they adapt in the world. And that's where the cognitive part really comes into play is how they're adapted, either emotionally, uh, spatially, um, socially, you, you name it, okay? Um, and their abilities, whether it's music, sports, whatever. All right, so let me share my screen with you here. I'm gonna go through some of the slides and just highlight some of the important parts of it so that we have a better understanding of, of what this uh, book is talking about, okay? Um, so let me back up just a little bit. All right, so during adolescence, and um, uh, early, late childhood, early adolescence, we start developing the self-concept and the self-esteem, okay? Now, um, there, there's really two differences here that I want, want to uh, point out is the self-concept and self-esteem are a little bit different, okay? Um, self-esteem is, is how a person views themselves in, um, in terms of being positive or negative, um, do they have, hold themselves in high esteem or do they, um, or do they kind of have a negative outlook on their, their abilities? Okay. And, and we're going to dissect self-esteem and self-efficacy later, but in terms of self-concept, their, their, their self-concept is kind of a blueprint that they have in their head. They know what, what, uh, they start to develop what their triggers are for certain anxieties. Like if they don't like, uh, anything but chicken McNuggets or something or chicken nuggets or something. They'll know why, because they don't taste well, because they don't like, or I'm sorry, because other food doesn't taste as well. They're not as easy to cook. They start to develop these concepts. Earlier on, it's just, I just want chicken nuggets. They don't ask the why, but the why start to fill in with the self, the idea of the self-concept. Um, we'll start to see their identity form, okay? Uh, and, and that those are in terms of change or crises. Now, what Liana was talking about earlier is how was that identified or how was that identity um, squelched? How, how was that really that when they when these later uh, the, these uh, preteens and teenagers were starting to develop socially, they were stripped away from the, that, those abilities because they weren't able to participate in school activities or um, lunchroom discussions or anything like that. They really had to um, shift their perspective and shift, shift their abilities. And this happened in, in the wake of a crisis, okay? So a crisis would be something that's dramatically changed that really upsets the balance of, of, the, of the adolescent or the child to the point where they have to make necessary changes in order to feel like they're surviving, feel like they're thriving. So um, that's the difference. So that's crisis change is something that we kind of just adapted as or adopted as just a normal trajectory of things. You know, we uh, we tend to move schools, right? For example, uh, that, that's expected of us in most situations. Believe it or not, here in, in West Virginia, there are a couple of places that still have a one school model. So um, they're still in the same building, physical structure as they were when they were in kindergarten going into um, adolescent age, you know, what, what would normally be their high school years. So that can happen on a rare occasion, uh, occasion. but for societal norms, we mostly see children going to, to different buildings, different schools, different, um, having that different interaction with people that are more aligned with their age group and, and abilities and, and um, intellect, okay? So um, we might see that transition, a normal change would be from, for example, from middle school to high school. And we would see social changes occur with that. Uh, we're gonna talk about 
uh, James Marsh, uh, Marsh's approach to identity development. Um, we'll get into that and we'll uh, uh, discuss how that's a little bit different from Erickson because there were some, as we talked about last week, there are some uh, limitations to what Erickson can and cannot describe, okay? Um, we'll get, we'll talk a little bit about that. If we have time today, we'll get into religion and spirituality and how that starts to develop with adolescence. And then of course, um, by the end of this week, I do want to touch upon depression and suicide because those are rising issues as we talked about and have seen in the news lately. We're seeing a lot more younger and younger, um, I'm going to call it, I'm going to say children completing suicide. Um, and that's a big issue, right? We shouldn't be there where we're seeing an increase of children encountering so much anxiety and so much depression, fear of the world and, and helplessness that they want to take their own lives. So um, that's a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And hopefully you'll, you'll see some benefit in discussing how we can avoid those, uh, those sort of situations, right? All right, so in terms of self-concept, I, I kind of already touched upon this. What am I like? That this is where they start to develop that, that idea of uh, how they can become more organized, how they can be more aware of their surrounding, how they can get into certain things. So the self-concept, again, is just a roadmap it's, or a blueprint uh, or whatever you want to call it. it. It's a way for them to meet certain goals. They start to develop these in their heads. That doesn't mean that they know exactly what they're going to do, what they're going to go to school for, where they're going to live. But they start asking these questions because they start to get that sense of, yeah, I'm good at this. Maybe this is the direction I'm going to go make money and be happy about that. So they may have several paths that they start to pick and choose from to develop these skills and hone in on these goals and start taking measures to meeting these goals. But at this age, it could be vast. I've met some adolescents that were very succinct. They were very precise on where they wanted to go. Uh, it happens, you know, occasionally I get a very driven uh, adolescent in my office that knows exactly where they want to go and they stay on that trajectory because that's something that they're impassioned about. Sometimes they may have an idea where they want to go and they encounter a lot of roadblocks, like maybe they can't get in the school that they want. But anyway, this is where that self-concept starts to develop and it progresses over the lifespan of their adolescent years until they uh, get into those upper adolescence, you know, 11th, 12th grade, and reality starts to set in that, uh, hey, maybe I need to start taking steps to apply to colleges, start solidifying uh, my self-concept a little bit more. But we start to see that usually in late childhood, um, early, early adolescence. And, and you, might, you might be able to pick that out with uh, children that or late children or young teenagers that start to, to talk about those things, saying, that they wanna be the president or they wanna be um, an ambassador, they wanna be an astronaut, right? I mean, we see that earlier on in their lives, but they really have no logical steps to get there. But at this point, we'll start to see some of those aloof and maybe unrealistic. Uh, and I'm not saying that we, we should ever debunk a child's desire to do those things, but uh, we'll start to see reality set in, in as far as what they need to do, okay? Um, self-esteem. How do I like myself? Okay, we all, I, I liken this to um, having friends. And, and we all have friends. We have friends that we like more than other friends. We're, we have friends that we can hang out for days with and go on vacations with. And then you have those friends that you are a little bit limited in your time and how you really want to spend that with them and how much you can absorb of them before you need to have a break for a couple hours or a couple days or even, maybe even a couple of years, depending on your relationship. But the self-esteem is looking at yourself and saying that, that same thing. How do I like myself? How do I like my thoughts? How do I enjoy being where I am and doing what I'm doing? Or would I rather just be in bed and, and forget about it or engage in some kind of addiction or distraction so that I don't have to think about uh, being with myself and being with my thoughts? So that's really all self-esteem is, is on, like on a scale of one to 10, how well do I really like myself? Okay. Now, when we get into self-efficacy, which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in, I think, early adulthood, self-efficacy is matching how you uh, trust yourself to attain certain goals or, or uh, complete certain tasks. Okay. 
Um, if we see a mismatch, and again, I'll get into this a little bit more uh, with self-esteem and self-efficacy, we usually want to see self-efficacy and self-esteem be around the same level because if one is mismatched, like if somebody really likes themselves, but their, their ability to complete certain tasks are really low, we might have a, a little bit of a break of reality and that person might not be grasping what their true capabilities are. And that kind of goes back to Eric Erickson's with, um, with uh, uh, looking at autonomy, right? Are they independents? Do they feel like they're independent, but are they truly independent? If there is a mismatch, we could see things crop up later on in life, like narcissism or um, uh, unrealistic, setting unrealistic goals, things like that, okay? And then vice versa, if you have self-efficacy, which is at a higher level than self-esteem, like somebody is really capable of doing something, but they don't feel like they are. We could have like inferiority. I mean, might, they might feel inferior all the time. They might not feel like they're capable and constantly asking questions, which could strain their, their sociability in those cases, all right? So anyway, that's not really all self-esteem is, is how do I like myself? Um, and, and within the world and, and my experiences, okay? Um, gender differences in self-esteem. On uh, research has shown that adolescent boys, they really have a higher self-esteem than girls. Why do you think that is? At least in the last 40, 50 years. Media and societal pressures. Okay, okay, what do you mean by that? Um, so, like thinking the last 40 or 50 years, um, you've had um, really the growth and explosion of the supermodel and the use of the internet and social media. And so that really changed the way that um, individuals partake in media and there are all these different things coming at them where like for the girls you have all the female influencers who look a certain way and I I mean I'm, I'm speaking solely from a female perspective but for boys it's not that way and boys are also taught that like it matters more what's in their head than anything else whereas for girls it's the other way around okay okay that's uh that, that that's a good inference there um and and i would agree to that largely i mean we, we do see a lot of pressure not just with girls but with boys as well right and i would say that boys have more of a pressure to be doers and not necessarily thinkers right um looking back through, through generations before. That has really been the trend is the, the males are the doers. They complete the, um, the they, they are the hunters and gatherers, right? They're the ones that go out for work and they don't spend a lot of time with family. Whereas uh, girls are, are really trained to uh, raise children and clean house and, and kind of um, just be, have, have more time to be the thinkers and live up to certain gender expectations, right? So we're getting better with that. We're not quite there yet, but we are getting better in seeing that, that uh, girls do have the same expectations as boys. And you brought up a really good point with media, multimedia or, or through the media, through, through television or through magazines. I don't know if anybody reads magazines anymore, but at least social media, we do see certain body expectations, right? We see the the uh, 20 year old uh, male with chiseled abs and, and pectoral muscles, you know, and just built. And, and trust me, I mean, I've, I've gone through those phases where I look at the mirror thinking, huh, maybe I should work on that a little bit more because, you know, that's, that's what society looks at. Um, uh, and, and we're all subject to that to some degree. Uh, but we are seeing a, a, a lot of the media perpetuating um, what, how that, how we should view ourselves. And if we don't like what we see, then we are gonna start rating ourselves uh, and that self-esteem scale a little bit lower um, each time that we ask those questions. Well, maybe I could do better, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, self-esteem does play, um, or I'm sorry, gender does play a big role on, on self-esteem and, and what the media perpetuates and what are even within our house or within our homes that uh, they're perpetuating. 
Uh, a lot of children struggle with obesity, right? Um, maybe not necessarily because of diet and exercise, but because of genetic reasons. So what would the implications be if, if we had an overcritical parent that was um, constantly remarking on, on a child's weight or making them feel less than because of the weight? We're gonna see a drop in that self-esteem. And we might see that a little bit more in girls than we would boys. So really uh, kind of important to keep that in mind, okay? Um, socioeconomic status and race and differences, of course, you know, looking at self-efficacy and even in the self-prophecy, okay? Uh, how we think we're going to wind up. I, you know, I just, I know some of you are just joining me, but I uh, just attended a motorcycle safety course. And, and this is a concept that, that I, I, they said this in the course and I just kind of thought of psychology immediately because that's what I do. Um, but does, has anybody driven a motorcycle or ever been on a motorcycle before? Okay, Joe. So you, you would probably be able to better answer. So what, what is it that they tell you, if you don't, if you look at something on the ground, where are you gonna go? Um, probably to the ground. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's one of the things they teach you is if you see a pothole in the road, you wanna scan ahead. And if you see an obstacle, you don't look at that obstacle. If you, if you look at the ground, that's where your bike's going to go. And that's kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, I thought of self-fulfilling self prophecy when they said this, because if that's what we look at, and that's where, uh, that's where we're going to have a tendency of going. So if we look at ourselves as being impoverished, and, and we're in a, a poverty-stricken neighborhood, and we just kind of give up and say, well, this is where I am, this is who I am, then that's where they're going to be. Um, so as educators, as, as healthcare professionals, and even as parents, you know, setting those bar, that setting that bar a little higher and saying, uh, just because you're here doesn't mean you have to stay here. You know, helping children to, to get, break beyond those barriers. And a lot of people have, a lot of people have been successful, but I do find that most common with, uh, with children that are, especially if they come into my office, adolescents that are tired of the fighting, they're tired of the crime. Um, I can help them if, they, if they're in that mindset. It's very easy to help somebody from that standpoint saying, well, what do you want to do? And again, start going back to that self-concept. What are you capable of doing and where do you want to go? Start building those blueprints. And that oftentimes helps um, uh, children to, to get to where they need to go. And there's a lot of money out there. Connecting as a, as a healthcare professional, I can connect people with resources. So if they want scholarships, if they want um, any kind of uh, uh, subsidies or any financial help or anything like that. There's a lot of stuff out there. So if you're going to be in the mental health or medical fields, or even in the, as an educator, be aware of your community support and, and, and the uh, funds that are available and the resources that are available for, for uh, kid, kids that start to develop that self-esteem and self-confidence and want to break out of the, these cycles. Okay. All right, so we, uh, we, we talked last week about Erickson's identity versus identity confusion stage. We see that at, at the adolescent stage, right? And if you remember, so 12, about 12 to 18 years of age, where they start to figure out what their, unique, what their uniqueness is, what sets them apart from their peers, and how can they put that into their self-concept so they can start to devise ways of meeting their long-term goals. This is where long-term goals, again, they start to map that out a little bit more succinctly. Um, those who tend to uh, have to struggle with identity, um, we, we start to see a lot of dysfunction occur. We might see more dressing in, uh, you know, kind of filling, and I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, I kind of fell into this camp when I was in high school. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to go to school. I didn't know what I, I knew what I was good at, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I really kind of fell into the camp of just exploring different areas. You know, I was, a uh, uh, I'm going to use the word band geek because I was, um, I, I did a little bit of sports. I, no kidding, got into goth for a little bit. So I wore all black, wore the makeup, uh, and, and hung out with people that were a little bit different. Okay. They were eccentric. Uh, but that was part of my process of finding my own identity. 
you know, it wasn't all, I don't, I don't want anybody to think that I went through school getting straight A's or anything. You know, I fished around for a little bit and that's kind of what this is about. And just because children are going through this or adolescent teens are going through this doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Now, there are some markers that we can look to see, make, make sure that their identity, um, that they're seek, searching for their identity is on the right path. You know, we probably want to stay away from drugs, right? Are we going to be able to prevent it? Probably not. You know, that really depends on how the child was raised and the morals. And we're going to talk about morals. I know uh, I mentioned last week that we we're going to get into um, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg's moral uh, development. Uh, and I do want to get into that uh, and describe that a little bit more. But we start to put those morals into place through example, through resources, through the environment, through, you know, the things that we can control, we want to control for, for adolescents, but, or, or for children. Um, but at, you know, sometimes they're going to be there by chance. They might meet up with somebody that does look for escapism and does look for drugs uh, or, or introduce them to drugs. And, and that may happen. They may try it. They may not try it, but looking out for um, markers that might indicate that they're getting into some unhealthy practices and then having a conversation with them uh, um, on, on how to, to negotiate these peer pressures is important. Does anybody, just out of curiosity, does anybody have any experience, like either with your own children or with yourselves, on, on how to get through those, those phases? Like if a child does experiment through this identity see seeking, does experiment with unhealthy practices such as, um, such as substances? Does anybody have any suggestions on how to get through those, those stages? So maybe this would be a, a good exercise later. Uh, all right, no, no, no suggestions. Okay, well, maybe, maybe start thinking about that because maybe this might, I, I think we might have uh, an activity on this. I know this is a loaded question uh, and it's a political one too, because we can't lock teenagers up. <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't shelter them. We can't be with them every second. Uh, so we kind of have to just trust that, uh, that things went on a, on a good path for them. Uh, and they're making good decisions when they're not within our view. I, I kind of have a, a, a funny story with this. With, so my kids, we went to, to Rehoboth Beach. Uh, I'm sorry, not Rehoboth Beach. Uh, um, where were we? Ocean City, Maryland, many, many years ago. Now, my son just turned 21 this year. So I want to say, whew, I want to say they were probably around 10 and 11 years old about that. And they were just eager to go to the arcade and they wanted to go by themselves. And um, my, my, uh, my partner at the time, we had kind of a differing view. Uh, she was more of a, a helicopter parent always wanted to be around and 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 be near them and have them within their sight and i'm kind of a, a more of a, an adventurous mind i grew up in the backwoods of pennsylvania and i had thousands of acres at my disposal now not that necessarily we didn't have thousands of acres but i could go up in the woods and spend all day and my only rule was come back uh before dark and there are a couple times i blew past that a little bit but i was never out all night or anything like that but i had a pretty free range and it got me thinking well, what if we just let them try this? You know, I was responsible. They're asking for it. And it kind of, it, it made, it, it brought up some interesting discussions as far as my carelessness and, and letting them do this. So one of the things I did um, was we agreed, we gave them a, a set of rules to, to see how they would, uh, they would follow these rules. They had to stick together. They weren't allowed to talk to strangers. They had to have our number on speed dial in case anything happened. And um, we let them ro uh, roam out uh, by themselves. Now, here's the key. I went with them. They didn't know it. <laughs> I, was, I was like ducking behind trash cans and sitting on park benches and just kind of watching them from afar. Now, hindsight, it probably uh, would have looked pretty creepy if anybody was watching me do this. But um, you know, I, I just wanted to see. I wanted to see how they behaved. And, they got into, you know, my, my son was doing parkour off of the dumpsters and stuff like that, you know, acting a little bit goofy. But for the most part, um, they did very well. They stuck together. They, they didn't do anything that they weren't supposed to do. 
And we did that. We, we uh, did that a couple of times with them, let them go out on their own. And I kept them a little bit closer until I was confident that they were making some good choices. And I was able to eventually, you know, uh, didn't turn them completely on their own at 10 and 11, but I was there when they didn't know that. So, so kind of coming up with ways like that to, to just get a sense of what they do on their own and how they behave on their own um, when, when you're not around, that, that, kind of, that, that helps you to maybe raise some red flags and um, have conversations with them so that they could maybe um, uh, gain your trust a little bit better, okay? Um, all right. So, and, and I just, my only point in bringing that up was just that as they're forming their identity, you can, as parents, can have a, a little bit more of an active role in identifying potential issues you know, with that identity, identity formation. Uh, societal pressures on reliance on friends and peers, okay? Um, adolescents, they do rely more on peers than they do uh, than adults at this stage, right? Because they're more independent. They're, they're spending more time in classes. They're getting into extracurricular activities. They're beginning to probably ride their bikes in a little, little bit more of a wire or scooters or segways or whatever it is they have. It used to be skateboards and rollerblades. I don't think anybody does that anymore. Um, but uh, anyway, they, they start to develop this social network of, of friends, either online or within their school system, all right? Um, and with that, they're going to start latching on to other self-concepts as other peers and, and um, adolescents and teens that are of similar age and similar intelligence and similar abilities and likes and dislikes, they're going to start latching on to what their peers are doing. I saw this almost immediately with, with some of my, uh, well, yeah, uh, my kids when they were going through this stage. They were seeing uh, adolescents going, that teenagers going on to college and their idea was, well, I wanna go with them. I wanna go with them and, and do what they're doing. Um, and, and that was a hard conversation to have with them. That was a hard conversation for them to have with me. Well, why do you wanna go to college? To, to uh, what, what are you planning on doing in, in college there? Well, I don't know. Okay, so that furthers a conversation. Well, then um, do you wanna just pay money to go to be with your friend or do you, do you wanna come up with plans? And starting that conversation with them so that they can start expanding on their self-concept and hopefully be able to um, come up with a plan so they can have the best of both worlds, be with their friends and um, meet their, their long-term goals or set their long-term goals on something. Um, so anyway, we, we see that a lot is they'll, they'll just start to latch on to their peers and do what their, uh, what their, their friends are doing, okay? Um, so there, there is a little bit of pressure with that with the identity versus identity confusion stage. And so what would have been the danger if um, say uh, an adolescent that was wanting to go to college to be with their friend and do what their friend was doing, but had no clear picture on what they were going to do there? Um, what do you think the, the pitfall would have been in allowing a, um, somebody to do that? Well, in college, you also go through another set of difficulties within your identity and your, and like your self image. And so if you like, I've seen it before too. Like if you go into school into further education with no idea of what you want to do, that can really be harmful to your self-identity and your self-image because you're seeing all these other people, your peers, all the other people in your cohort going on and kind of solidifying what they want to do in life. And you're just going further into debt, not knowing what you want to do. There is that factor. And, and I would say that on, on the whole, that's probably uh, by and large, probably the most common trend we see is, is uh, uh, kids that go into college and they don't know what they want to do, but they're there and they're partying and they're having a good time, but they have no clear path. Their self-concept is a little skewed. And that's kind of an opportunity for educators and parents and, and caregivers alike to um, kind of see, you know, do you have a general idea of what you want to do? Because it's okay. It's okay to go to college and not know exactly what you want to do. Um, I think college is a, a great step, if nothing else, to give you that experience of what it's like to be in college. 
Um, yeah, it's an expensive, it, 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 it's an expensive experience and there's no cheap way to do it. And, but I think it's an important step, especially if, if somebody has ideas of working in a profession and, um, and doing something other than, than uh, doing, uh, what am I thinking? Um, minimal wage jobs or unskilled labor is what I'm thinking. So uh, yeah, if, they're, if they have ideas of what they, that's still a goal and they, they, we're encouraging them to do that. On the reverse end of this, so my uh, partner's daughter, it just I think I shared this last, last week, um, she started attending college this year and she's kind of in the reverse role where she is very driven. She is very, she's got uh, great ideas of where she wants to go. And she, uh, she's a straight A student. I mean, almost to the point of perfectionist. And she's in a dorm full of other freshmen that are just, they're pledging to um, sororities and they're, they're drinking every night and it's a mess. I mean, and so she's kind of caught up in that peer pressure stage. Well, I don't, she doesn't like where she is currently and it's affecting her uh, in, in terms of her mental health because she is very, um, she, she wants to fit in. She wants to do things that other people are doing, but they're not doing what she wants to do. So those are conversations that we have with her regularly, regularly is trying to figure out a way, well, how do you protect your, your psyche? How do you pr protect what you want to do and stay focused on, on uh, achieving your goals? And interestingly enough, she had contacted us this week saying how, um, how it, it, she kind of feels validated now because I guess a couple of them have like 0.2 uh gpas <laughs> and they're not doing well and of course she's probably one of the higher gpas in, in in her dormitories but that would be a reverse situation is how do you keep how do you keep kids level when they're faced with such adversity when they're faced with such social challenges and not feeling like they fit in because what we saw with that was her self-esteem was taking a little bit of a hit Everybody else is having fun and they're partying and she's the workaholic. She's the one driving them around and getting, being the responsible one. And that made her feel a little bit less than. So what are ways we can boost them up to, to let them know that they're doing the right thing? A lot of that is through validation, listening, and, and helping them to, to stay directed on what they want to do, focusing on their strengths as opposed to uh, what's not going right, okay? All right. So uh, again, we we're not we don't have to go through this because we went through this last week. Um, we look at uh, we've already negotiated for the most part. Some some adolescents negotiated industry versus inferiority, and now we start to crop up on identity versus identity confusion, uh, awareness of their self. Right? Uh, what? Uh, who are they? What makes them up? How do they like themselves? That all happens uh, through identity as they start to solidify that self concept, that blueprint of who they are and where they're going, okay? And of course, the inability to identify uh, their role in life can have uh, long-lasting consequences. And uh, Liana, I think you said it perfectly. We kind of see a second coming in college years, right? And we also see that when we get done with college. I know a lot of students that have graduated college and they still haven't solidified that identity. They had ideas of what they wanna do when they were in high school. They pursued those goals in college, and now they get into the real world. And, and we'll talk about that when we get into um, early adulthood as to how they need to start identifying them or uh, getting into that identity again. Now, one thing I would like to point out with uh, establishing an identity is it takes practice because we are always faced with this. We are, I I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here when many of you have probably reinvented yourself from a previous goal, a previous set of goals, or maybe even a previous lifestyle, right? I, I, I mean, I can speak from ex experience and say, I've probably been through at least five or six, or if not more, I've lost track there, actually. Um, so going through these phases and going through these changes requires us to shift our identity, being okay with uh, letting things go, right? Letting go of feelings, letting go of thoughts that we had that we were going to be somewhere where we're not, right? Because that's not life. You know, we, we can plan all we want and then COVID happens or we can plan all we want and then some kind of natural disaster happens that wipes out our, our towns, um, God forbid, or something, you know? So we have, uh, we have life that happens and the more we get used to um, forming these identities, these new uh, identities and filling these new positions, 
and our new lots in life and our new communities, the easier it gets. So something to keep in mind, you brought up a really great point, Leon, and I definitely wanted to, to hone in on that a little bit. Um, so uh, the final point here, what we have, um, and you'll hear me talk about this in the next slide, is a psychological moratorium. Um, this was something that was described by Eric Erickson and what he described it as the letting go of responsibilities for a while to explore new roles and new possibilities. He doesn't really fit that into his model. Um, but one of the things that, that uh, we'll talk about when we get into Marshall's theory is that this was a very big limitation to Eric Erickson's theory. Because again, if you look at it, it's very uh, uh, stage oriented, right? There, there are certain stages. And again, what that does, that sets up for expectations that if they don't meet these certain stages by these certain years, that there's something wrong. And that's absolutely not the case. What I think is the biggest takeaway from this is the, around these ages are where we should experience, a like for example, um, two to three years, we should ex experience autonomy versus shame and doubt. That's usually in society, that's about normal for where we would experience that. We're gonna experience that a lot throughout our lives. Um, we're gonna like for trust versus mistrust, that's probably when we're both first and foremost exposed to uh, can we trust our environment? Can we trust our needs are going to be met? Or are we going to be skeptical and, and worried about that? That actually develops, according to Marsha, that develops throughout our lifespan. Okay, we're going to have periods where we may trust everything. And then we're going to have something that, that hits us and that's going to take us back to think, oh, maybe I don't trust things that, that well. Um, we may trust that failure is going to lead us to something um, more positive in life. I, I think um, everything happens for a reason, I think is probably the most common quote uh, that I hear with that. Uh, having a little bit more trust that things are going to work out for themselves and letting go of the things that, that uh, we're, we shouldn't be focusing on helps us to negotiate some of, these, um, some of these stages a little bit easier. But it is an ongoing process, okay? So uh, one of the other limitations of Erickson's theory is that male identity uh, really helped to develop the standard um, he didn't really take into account the, the female identity too much with that. Um, as, as we saw, I think uh, we brought up Oprah as an example last week and just how uh, she, she kind of negotiated all of those phases that she should have encountered uh, during her formative years. She encountered much, much later, right? And she became the uh, wonderful, thoughtful person that she is today, okay? So uh, James Marsha, who came significantly later, probably you know, right around the 60s, 70s, start to, uh, we start to see a lot more of, um, uh, of crises occur within adolescent females, okay? So James Marsha was able to identify some of these, these uh, crises that were occurring and adopted um, his own four categories of adolescent identity in terms of uh, the characteristics crisis versus commitment, okay? So when we say crisis, are we avoiding, are we uh, encountering some negative attributes towards these, these roles or uh, towards these achievements, or are we uh, uh, taking them and, and holding them and committing to them to the point where we're going to put that into our self-concept, which we, we talked about earlier. Um, so those four stages are identity achievement, identity foreclosure, uh, moratorium, uh, and, and if you don't know what moratorium, moratorium is a brief break from something. So, for example, um, if you go back to, I'll use the, cri the COVID crisis, when, uh, and I, I, if I remember correctly, I think Hack did the same thing. Did we, I think we extended our spring break, right? That would be considered a moratorium because we had a little bit of a break, uh, an unscheduled break to just kind of regroup and, and recollect ourselves to be able to come up with a plan and move forward. So that's what a moratorium is. It's just kind of taking a step back and taking a break away from something. So I know I, I mentioned that word earlier and I just wanna make sure you understood what that was. Identity diffusion is gonna be the fourth one. So within, I, let's see if we chart this one out, they don't. Um, so within identity achievement, uh, again, just looking at the adolescence, uh, the difference between James Marsha 
uh, theory is uh, from Erickson's is that this really focus, this one focuses on the, the four stages that we see in adolescent identity. So identity achievement, okay? Um, this is the status of, of the uh, young adults who they really espouse that, that identity for a period of time uh, or maybe even a crisis, uh, which they might need to, to get through a, a situation, right? We'll see a personality shift, especially when, when, when kids are going from a middle school to a high school, right? We might see them outgoing in middle school and then right around their, their uh, ninth or 10th or whatever grade they go into high school, they might become shy. They might become a little bit more observant. They might become a little bit more unsure of themselves. And that's okay. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of parents I have described to me that they're worried about their, their child. And what is a tendency when a parent starts worrying about a child's shift in, in mood or shift in uh, identity? Why could that be problematic? It might inhibit the child. Okay. In, in what way? I mean, if they're worried about their, their identity changing, mm -hmm. um, it could make the child feel as though it's not okay. It's not okay for them to explore these different things. Right. Because what shifts with, with, that, uh, with that child's uh, uh, negotiation of identity? What sh not only does the child shift, but what does the parent do? they shift too, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind is consistency, consistency in the home life. Um, and I'm not saying that the parents shouldn't get involved. They should absolutely be involved. And if anything else, validate how they feel. Make sure that they know that it's okay that they're going through this, that this is a normal process um, and not be dismissive of it, but open the, the, the channels for communication maybe do a little bit more without expectations. You know, I, I, I kind of went through this phase with my daughter um, where she was going through some, some identity uh, roles when she graduated because she had ideas that she was gonna go to college um, and she didn't, you know, she didn't wanna go to college right away. She's uh, just graduated last year and, and she's uh, taken a year off. And I said, that's okay. Um, she was nervous about getting into school and um, you know, we, we talked about extensively and I even set up dates, you know, date nights so we can go and do stuff together just for the sake of, of keeping those channels open. And we could talk or we could not talk, but as long as she felt like she had that avenue, it was okay. And she's doing great. You know, she's starting to get the creative juices going and thinking about where she wants to go. Um, and, and that's, that's, I mean, that I couldn't ask for a better way for that to turn out. Um, but during these identity achievements, just making sure that it's okay that they shift a little bit because this is a normal process. Normalizing that shift uh, goes a long way when they're, when they're negotiating this. Um, identity foreclosure, um, not adequate, having uh, not enough personal exploration, um, but made a commitment, okay? So uh, usually we see this when, children, uh, when adolescents are following the direction of others like going to college because somebody else is going there with them, right? And again, um, normalizing that, that, that's something that, that happens. You know, we want to be like our peers are doing, right? I've got, guy, I've got uh, uh, people in mind, um, people that I work with that I think, man, that'd be great if I could achieve that, that certain status or that certain influence. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, kind of lost my train of thought, but anyway, just making it normal that they that the uh, that they can or they do want to have that that following, and that's okay to do that. And then the moratorium, they're exploring around. Uh, they don't necessarily commit to an option um, because that might create anxiety and conflict. And again, going through communication and open lines of communication, uh, open channels of communication with them. And, letting, and, and maybe helping them get out of that stuck phase, right? Uh, moratorium can be a good thing. Moratorium uh, what turned to being, I guess, like in stuck in the mud can be um, a, a little bit daunting for, for them. So who do they look for when negotiating these the anxiety and conflict with, with what their goals are, with what they're trying to meet with their goals? They look to educators. They look to parents. They might look to 
healthcare, uh, mental health professionals or counselors or friends uh, that, that may have negotiated those, those conflicts, all right? Um, and, and helping them to maybe come up on their own with a, a plan, uh, letting them know, well, this is what I did. This may not work or may or may not work for you, but this is what I did when I was going through that. Um, and just validating how they feel, maybe that you were in a similar situation um, and, and helping them to come up with, with creative ways to, to get around it, to get out of that unstuck uh, phase. And then our, our, last, um, our last outcome of this would be identity diffusion in which they um, consider alternatives, but they really never commit to anything. And I see this in, in adulthood, um, much later adulthood where um, adolescents never really negotiated this. They never figured out what it was that they wanted to do to the point where they start to have regret later in life because they could have, should have, would have done something differently had they had the opportunity, but they didn't, okay? Um, let's see here. All right, so I'm actually going to, so let's let's get into, um, I was, yeah, I was, I was gonna try and put this off. I'm going a little bit quicker than I wanted to today. Um, so religion and spirituality. Now, these are not, uh, not one of the same and not mutually exclusive. So what, I'm just curious, what, does anybody have a, a, a stance on what religion is versus what spirituality is? Because it's very important to understand the difference between the two of these. Um, I, a religion is sort of a, a, um, following a codes and ethics, um, in, with a, in a group setting, I would say, um, related to involving spirituality. Um, and I think spirituality is more of a connection to a sense of um, there being something beyond just this world that we live in or a higher, some sort of higher or more universal um, um, presence, which people call God. Yeah, yeah, perfectly said. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, but yeah, religion is looking at some kind of organization or some kind of institution to follow that guidance. Um, and, and I apologize, I know this slide says, uh, God, I did not update this. The, um, this, is, this slide actually came from the publisher, it's available on our website. But um, it, it, it could be any deity, it could be any um, entity, that that uh, that that you draw your your strength, your power, your your guidance from. Okay, uh, so anyway, with the increased understanding of how the world works and how uh, the universe works and how our family might adopt certain uh, ideals, that comes from so oftentimes that comes from an institutional religion, and which are a set of guidelines and goals and practices and traditions and rituals even. Okay. Spirituality is more of a mindset. It's how open we are to the, the world existing as it is. Not necessarily in a scientific, but I mean, you can have spirituality in science too. I consider myself, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I love science. I think uh, science, is, it, it helps us to understand the world around us. Does it answer everything? Absolutely not. Um, I don't think we have the capability of understanding the universe because we have we are very, very limited in, in our brain capacity, in our uh, human abilities, right? We are human. None of us fly around. None of us have teletransportation that we know of. Um, so we are a very limited uh, entity on, in, in this world. Um, uh, but spirituality is the understanding of what our role is in this universe, in this world, in this um you know, whatever you want to call it in this realm, okay? Uh, so with adolescence, we start to see a little bit more questioning, all right? That, it, it, as the slide shows, during childhood, we have kind of a, a literal view of our deity, a literal view of, of um, our whatever religion our parents practice, if they practice one at all. But it guides our sense of right and wrong to some ability because we're following the norms are following the rules. And again, as, as, um, as the human condition is, we rely on other people. We are a pack animal. And if we don't have that reliance, we don't have that cohesiveness, 
then we kind of feel isolated and ostracized, which is very painful emotionally, painful psychologically for us. So anyway, to fit in and follow these practices is very important during childhood, right? Now we get into adolescence, we start to see a little bit of, in, in some cases, okay, not all cases, uh, but in some cases we start to see um, spirituality is more abstract. It's not very black and white. It's not very by the book, um, but we start to question things a little bit more when we go through adolescence, right? Many of you probably remember growing up and not breaking the law. You know, we don't break the law. We don't do that. We don't, uh, if the speed limit says 55, we go no more than 55. We get a little bit older. What do we do with those speed limit signs? We push it a little bit. We push it a little bit sometimes. Yeah, right. we go 59 because we have this idea that the cops won't pull you over or anything uh, four miles. So anybody else hear about that? As um, long as you're slower than the fastest person. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's I think that's how I operate. Yeah, I, I don't be the fastest one out there, and you'll, you'll be okay. But I've actually seen like three or four cops uh, parked in the middle, and and they'll just nab like uh, you know the first four uh, that they find speeding. So yeah, that that doesn't even work anymore. So so don't be the fifth fastest person on the highway. Uh, don't speed either. at the end of the month. <laughs> yeah, that too, because I think that's where they put them all. You know, four or five in a row, and just try and nab them all. Um, but anyway, as we get into adolescence, we saw that we see that view of spirituality, we see them be a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say rebellious, because that's not always the case, but questioning a little bit more uh, in abstract terms, okay? And then when we get into post-adolescence, um, they'll start to solidify their, their uh, what they say, the uh, individuative, reflective stage, where they start incorporating what they learned in childhood and they, they might branch out into explore other religions or explore other depths to whatever religion they're currently practicing or spirituality, okay? Um, and then of course, in uh, adulthood, we have the conjunctive stage, uh, which might be more of a sense of ownership that I know it says, which includes broad inclusive view of religion and humanity, uh, but we do start to take in um, the world around us and incorporate that into our lot, our identity within that religion, if that makes sense. Okay. Let's see here. So I forget how long this video is. Actually, I'm not going to play this, this video. This, these slides are available if you want to uh, look at some of the videos on them. If we had a little bit more time, I would do that. Um, let's see here. Okay. Yeah. So this will finish up and then we can get into some psychological issues and Lawrence Colbert's um, uh, stages on Thursday. All right. So again, um, identity, race, and ethnicity, uh, looking at different models of this, we have the cultural assimilation model, which identify uh, or the identities um, should be uh, assimilated into one specific culture. There are some limitations to looking at this model in that we are constantly, especially over the last two or three decades, we are, our culture has really, um, I don't want to say it, it, it really diversified and, it, and, it's, and, and it's inclusive of a lot of different cultures anymore. Um, like for instance, you know, it was really uncommon for anybody to even know Spanish or have a need to know Spanish. But it's a very necessary, I think it's a very necessary skill. And for us to not teach that or not encourage that to be taught in school is harming ourselves because um, yeah, though we are uh, a nation uh, that, that's an English speaking nation, but we have a lot of, uh, that we have a lot of cultures that are embedded with us that maybe can't speak that, uh, can't speak English well enough. So it only helps us to maybe cross that, that language barrier sometimes and understand what somebody means if they can't get the words right or something like that. Um, I don't speak Spanish very well, but I, I do hear it. I do understand it. I can read a little bit. I don't pretend to have a conversation with anybody. I can, uh, I can order wine and find the library. Uh, and that's, a, well, that, that's all I can do fluently. But for the most part, I can certainly um, help people by understanding their culture, understanding their ethnicity and where they came from. Um, like, for example, when I'm counseling an individual that, uh, that from the, I'm going to use Hispanic community, um, one of the things we have to be very cautious of is not um, 
not pushing our own agenda, not pushing our own uh, cultural norms. And, and what I mean by that is I grew up very individualistic. I grew up uh, three with three boys and uh, all three of us were excited to get out of the house, right? Um, if, if I'm counseling somebody from a certain culture that maybe that that's not, they're more of a collective culture or they're maybe more family oriented or they come from bigger families that need them uh, for some capacity to either help uh, work with projects or help with income or something like that, that would be bad for me to, to be leading them down a path that might be that might ostracize them or get them into a bad family situation. So as a counselor and as healthcare professionals, uh, professionals in uh, education, be aware of what cultures you're dealing with in that area, right? Because uh, I know this says unified culture. There, there is no such thing as unifying culture. Uh, every culture we go into has a blend of something else. Um, and if you're in a very small community, that might be applicable for a small period of time, but that's constantly changing, okay? Uh, looking at pluralistic society model, which describes society being made up of diverse, co-equal cultural groups. This is more of what, what we're talking about, understanding that the world is changing, that the world is starting to merge uh, and, and get a little bit closer, okay? And then uh, bicultural is drawing from our own culture, uh, our own understanding of what our culture was and integrating that into uh, whatever culture we're dealing with, with population or wherever we live, okay? Um, and yeah, okay. All right. So this slide, just uh, uh, looking at this, this is just the number of Americans who identify them as belonging to more than one race uh, really grew substantially. And this says 2000 to 2010. I'm sure it has continued to grow beyond that. Uh, but look, just looking at how uh, interracial couples are, you know, we're, we're having more and more, it's been more accepted for interracial relationships to occur. And we're out of that, we're seeing uh, more interracial children uh, being, uh, being raised, okay? Um, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that was unheard of. Right, we didn't do that. Uh, that wasn't something that that was accepted back then. Now it's becoming a little bit easier. Um, I'm not saying it's there yet. I mean, I've been in this into some areas where it's not widely accepted, but we're getting a little bit better with that because uh, it's it's more the norm, right? Um, all right. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to hold off on anxiety because that's going to get into mental health stuff. But any, anybody have any thoughts? Anything they want to share? before we depart today. Crickets, it is clearly a Monday morning. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna stop recording here.